Any public comment or action, special guest? We do have a special guest. Um, Elisa Arjuna is here with us today from the mayor's office. Um, so she came in response to the letter that we wrote to the office of the mayor. So what we'll do is we'll get to the action items first before so we don't lose inform you that you'll be in the response. Mm -hmm. So we need to approve the uh, board minute. Everybody has a chance to take a look at them. So the actuals right now for 2015 effective, um, this brings us through 9.30. Uh, you can see that we are, we actually brought in more money, more uh, outstanding assessments were paid from previous years. So the rollover actually has increased to 211, uh, which is a positive variance of $96,000. A um, couple other minor uh, income uh, bumps, so we had a positive variance of $103,000 for income. So with respect to the actual budget uh, variances this year, if you look at the um, expected variance and the over-under analysis, safety and security at the end of the year, we're expecting about a $3,000 negative variance on a budget of um, $800,000. And maintenance, streetscape, and beautification will have a $7,000 um, positive variance a, on a budget of $465,000. Marketing and consulting will have a, almost an $11,000 positive variance on a budget of $40,000. District management, policy, and administration will be a $12,000 positive variance on a budget of $198,000. And then contingency, city fees, and reserve for non-paid. $3,900 positive variance. So what this tells us is that we expect to um, end the year with $135,000 in cash. And now that we are uh, coming to the end, we're, we're three years away from the bid ending. You know, the goal is to use up the cash. There's no incentive to hold on to cash as a typical nonprofit would be because you're, you're expected to, to use the assessment revenue each year that the property owners are paying it. But what we're going to recommend in this budget is that we roll over $65,000 of this um, surplus into the new budget and hold on, keep $69,000 in uh, the kitty uh, to kind of help with the you know, rollover in the, in the subsequent two years. So by virtue of taking advantage of that, if you go up to the top right hand corner again, the 2016 budget, you'd have a rollover of $65,000. You'd 
you have the assessment income of 1.52. And if you recall this year, I think it was a wise decision that you did um, levy a 0.5% CPI increase, and that amounted to about $14,000. So that's a 1.52 um, assessment revenue. Um, so that's your starting budget number, 1.585. And with respect to, you know, we, we have to stay, you know, in within the general proportionate categories that were originally established in the management district plan. And um, this proposed budget does that. It raises the security budget by about $8,300 to um, $883,000. Um, it uh, decreases the maintenance, streetscape, and beautification budget by 54000 so one of the things that we had this year is we, we had been holding on to a, a, uh, a sum of money for to do some special beautification projects, which is what you've actually been doing this year. Mm -hmm. And um, that money had accumulated for a couple of years, and the Streetscape Committee has done a pretty good job of extending it. They're only going to end up with $7,000 left. So um, in as much as they're, we're, we're not you know, impacting the basic maintenance budget, but there would be less for beautification projects. But one of the things that you still have available to you, and if you look over on the, there's a sheet of paper called the reconciliation sheet, which um, lays out the old bid, um, uh, the balance in the old bid is still $48,000, which you do really need to spend. And that can be visible, it looks like this. These are the different bank accounts. So the Streetscape and Beautification Committee could draw upon those monies as well for some of the special projects that they want to do next year or beyond. Um, the marketing and consulting would remain the same. The um, district management, administration, et cetera, will increase $10,000. Part of that, there's two things um, incorporated in that increase. One is with the change in the new office space, we are um, going to have a rent increase, and the Sunset bid pays 22% of the rent in the office space. So that will incorporate that. And there also will be some increase in um, legal and accounting expenses with our new um, accounting firm that has been working with us this past year. Yes. Real quick, um, what are the terms of the lease for the office? The lease will go through, um, I know we have a, an out clause in 2018 if the bid is not renewed, but I think it's a six year lease that takes us through to 2020 or 2021. Great. We hope to be moving, we thought we would be moving in by now, but it looks like we might move in right after Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. and Um, and then the contingency, we're actually um, budgeting slightly less because you've actually been collecting uh, the funds have been coming in pretty, pretty strong. So that brings um, the budget to 1.585 million. And um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. The other document that kind of accompanies this whole exercise is what's referred to as the uh, planning report, which is in your packet also as a draft. It is um, the document that we submit to the city clerk, and it uh, provides a narrative of what I, I just, I gave you the numbers, but this will describe the narrative of what it is that we're going to do within each of those budget categories. And it reflects changes over last year. So the marketing budget was a little, I'm assuming there are enough pending initiatives to use the money that wasn't used in the past year. Well that money, the way it works is that it doesn't roll over specifically into the marketing budget, it just goes into the general, you know, kitty that rolls mm -hmm. over. So the, the $10,000 that we're under, it doesn't beef up to the budget next year. It just ends up in, in no, the, I just, yeah. I just have a chance to look at actual to new budget and new budget. Well, I think, you know, the music festival, which we... Yeah, I think we'll do more. Yeah, we're going to do more next year. A lot of it happened in the Sunset Bid. Things like yeah. the Palladium and Aviva, right. 
uh, Space 1520 was the hub, and the Sunset Board did contribute $10,000 toward it, which was greatly appreciated. Uh, we will do a full debrief on the music festival next month, but I think it, I think it, it, we knocked it out of the park with respect to changing people's perception of Hollywood at night, and it was safe, and it was, there were a lot of pedestrians, there was a lot of positive activity, it had a lot of students yeah. involved, and we really met Emerson students, AMDA students, um, MI, and LA Film School, we had 65 student volunteers, and they were super enthusiastic, and they loved getting to know each other. So it was really a neighborhood building effort, which was cool. And I think that might be something that we would more intentionally um, take up to the next level next year. And the Hollywood Week, and there's any way we can be more involved with this? The Hollywood Week? Um, you know, <coughs> the venues really were along Selma and Coenga. Those were those were the ones that really yeah. stepped up to the Yeah, Piano Bar. Yeah, Mama Shelter. Yeah, Mama Shelter, the record store across from Piano Bar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, Avalon was involved, Fonda was involved, um, W was involved, but we... Could be more. Could be more, yes. Could be more. Yeah. All right, so do we have to approve this? Yes. <coughs> yeah. And it's another one in favor, Well, let's take each motion. So, the, the, the Treasury's report essentially is the where we are with the current budget, right. you know, right here. So, mm. that would be so, the first one. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll each one a yeah, Michael. Make a motion to approve the treasurer report. Second. Second. Very well. And any guys in favor? Uh, Stay. No? We got unanimous. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then we've got the budget. Here's the next one. A motion to approve the budget. Okay, so uh, you may want to move the approval. Yeah, make a motion to approve the 2016, 2016 budget. 2016 budget. Very well. All in favor? I can second it. Second that. I'm in favor, brother. Abstain? No. And then the planning report. And then the planning report. Which one's the planning report? This one right here. I'll make a motion. Motion. Very well. Second the review of the planning report for the city. Second. And all in favor? Good job. Good job. Yay! Very Yeah, I think that was the only way I sent it off to Steve to make sure that everything was, yeah. was uh, accurate, and that's right still. We'll clean up the underlines, crosshouts, and highlights before yeah. we send it off to the city. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. So because we, we, we might lose quorum, and we have just two action items, Elisa is willing to wait right. for a minute, and because I know we've got a couple of action items for the street state, and I just want to make sure we get a chance to do yeah. that. Okay, so uh, streetscape and planning community. Yeah, I'll report on that. Okay, good. So uh, you can turn to the MOU, it's right after the artwork. So um, we've learned that we were a little too optimistic in our timeline for this pop up installation. This is what Ellie Moss uh, presented at our last board meeting, and we were hoping to have it installed in time for the festival, but um, I'm learning about liability and income education, so um, just a little bit of a learning curve on this for me. And, and let me also just interject, this this was a, I was excited by the prospect of us getting this up for the festival as well, so we were probably thinking it was, we were forgetting about what always, you know, starts to unravel when you start to think about, well, who is going to be public comment for what. And what we learned after the board meeting is that so the property owner, Bill Sahabi, was very enthusiastic, as you know. He said that the people we had to negotiate with was Urban Outfitters because they actually had their the tenants and they have control. So that was new information, and now you're dealing with the national corporate 
you know, retail. Yeah, so there's there's layers. Gill owns the property, Urban Outfitters has a master lease, and then they sublease a portion of it to the parking operator. So there's layers here. So um, what we have is a, a draft of the MOU between the property owner, Urban Outfitters, CHC, and LA Moss. Um, so I know it's a little bit of information, but if you can just kind of skim over this and we can answer any questions. And actually, we appreciate your insight into this as property owners yourself to make sure that we are thinking through everything. Um, yeah, and we did have our attorney, Jeff Briggs, uh, draft this for us. The main thing we wanted to be able to do with um, Zahavi slash Urban Outfitters is make sure that with the investment that you're making in this pop-up, that he wouldn't turn around and change his mind after it's been installed for two weeks and say, oh, we want that to go away. Yeah. So um, I think that we've got the term, we've asked for six months, but um, recognizing that a three-month trial period is what was initially intended and that these extensions would be mutually agreed upon. If the materials that have been fabricated lack, they're made out of plywood, et cetera, so it's agreeing to that. Um, and then on the indemnification, each of the parties are indemnifying and hold each other harmless um, for things that could happen. Um, and and you have to uh, get insurance for this? We have insurance. We've got general liability insurance. So the way this was described to us is that everybody mutually indemnifies the other parties. Each party they carry their own uh, their own insurance. Mm -hmm. And the six month timeline starts with one the actual investigation that they would have to go ahead and start doing with the uh, the actual installation. Mm -hmm. The uh, company, this Lamont, how many people do they have in Florida? They have uh, five employees. Yeah. The only other thing, sometimes when you have more than one or two people, you get a couple of people the same. And then hmm. build the insulation and something happens. And right. Three people to carry. Um, you know, you can't make sure that they have a company. Yeah. yeah, so that would but be. Again, this is more related to the other, you need to have that separate. Yeah. yeah, and we have the, the second agreement is directly with Ellie Moss, mm -hmm. so I guess that's what we But that's a good thing to bring up. And I will tell you that one of the things that we did in good faith with them, they they went off and started purchasing materials after the board meeting without an agreement. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and they said that they had spent $10,000 for that. And I said, you know what, I'm really sorry you did that because we do not have an agreement yet. Right. Um, but, but in good faith, I paid 5000 of that. So um, we're going to make this work. You know, obviously, it's not going to happen in time for the, um, the uh, festival. But you know, I feel like I needed to step in and um, I stop it earlier, and it didn't happen. So they are on the hook for $5,000 right now. So everyone's deeply motivated to get this thing. So where is uh, Urban Affairs then? Are they uh, willing to sign? Yes, yeah, so we have a kind of a, you know, an email um, green light from them, but we're now having to finalize this and then send it back up the ranks for their sign-off. Yeah, it's a, I think, two weeks to hear back from them at the initial time, just to, to see if they were interested in the idea. So now, you know, this ought to go through their legal team, so. What if they come back and they say no? Um, I'm hoping that any any concerns they have, we can you know discuss and make modifications to the agreement. But um, so far, with as it stands, they're they're on board with us. And there's their staff team that's on board as well. Yeah, their local you know store managers um, are on board. Yeah, they're on 
And yeah, it gills a hog in the coffee and wants to make sure that they're willing to take ownership of this thing too. So. But if this guy come back and say, sorry, we cannot do it, then we're going to find another place to do it. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll work out a plan B. Because we are already. Yeah, we have plenty of yeah. <laughs> yeah, We have plenty of yeah, we've all, yeah. all right. All right, so do you need a motion to approve the MOU or the. So there's a few different motions. Yeah. So we need uh, somebody to move to approve the MOU drag between the CHC and the Urban Affiliate Area. Is that Harvey? Okay, we have on the top to move it. Uh, I invite the second. Alright, so, uh, everybody in favor? Uh, and then we have a motion to approve the agreement between the lay must and CHC. And I will um, check on the workers' compensation. Okay. Yeah, we do not have a line on that yet, but we can move that. Everyone move the um, agreement? I'll make a motion to approve with the um, potential changes to the workshop. Okay. And somebody to second that. And for a moment. So is everybody in favor? No. Opposed? No. Abstention. Thank you. Good. Good. So can we go to the guest presentation now? Yeah, we do usually not sit there. So um, I, uh, as you know, a few months ago, we had a um, conversation about the uh, increase in homelessness in Hollywood, the encampments, concerns expressed by um, tenants and residents, we have residents visit us here in this room, concerned about um, Hasn't it safe walking the streets of Hollywood at night? And uh, you know that's a concern when you're, you know, you're trying to build a little more neighborhood um, of the future. And um, at your request, and this is, I think we had the conversation before the city declared a state of emergency. So uh, some of the the feelings and the comments and the uh, multiple calls and complaints that we've been getting into the bid office were in a sense corroborated by ultimately finally our city leadership saying that this is a uh, bordering on a crisis in the city and um, so what we're experiencing in Hollywood we're experiencing throughout and including specific palisades where the fire was started by So we reached out to the mayor's office um, because this is a uh, important neighborhood for just job growth and vitality in the city and Greg Spiegel who is the homeless um, deputy um, he and I had talked about it I know him pretty well and he had a family emergency had to go back to London I believe yeah so Lisa actually is a great hire he hired her fairly recently um, I am on the home for good business leaders task force with United Way and Lisa worked for United Way for at least a couple Years. I'll let you tell your story. She's extremely knowledgeable and um, she's in a position to have a conversation with us from you know, City Hall and also to hear some of your issues and questions and concerns and maybe I'll take that to the mayor's office. So Lisa, thank you for being here. Sure, and as Carrie said, I really am here to listen to what's happening here on the ground or in Hollywood. I can give an overview about what the declaration of emergency how we're interpreting that, what are the follow-up actions to that, just kind of big picture. And then, but it's important to know what's going on here to understand how will that apply? How are we in the right direction? Are there other things that we need to consider, particularly as we move forward to 100 million? So just to back up a little bit, um, as Carrie mentioned, my background in homelessness policy, so I'm not on the political side. I've been working in homeless policy and direct services probably since about 1996, a lot of time in Philadelphia, and then when I moved back to here, both on the family side, single side, had experience at the local government, philanthropy, and now at the policy.
policy level. So this is kind of a passion. It's something that one day I want to say I can move on to a different career because we define me as Indian in this list. It's not something I sought out to kind of end up in. But I guess my interest was community development and then just kept running into the intersection with homelessness and how do we build inclusive communities where all can have a sense of belonging and all have a place and how to go. So with all that said, on September 22nd, Mayor Garcetti, along with City Council, made a press announcement of declaring an emergency. And there was a commitment of $100 million in resources to finally address homelessness. And looking at it since that time, what did that really mean? What was the impetus of it? From the council side, it was a way to really streamline our planning process, so permitting and zoning issues, to both build um, affordable housing development as well as emergency or what we call crisis housing to just literally be able to move people off of the street. And so there's a lot of, um, that was kind of like people see the need, we had this 12% increase according to our recent hit count, and people were just, we're looking at what you guys I'm sure are seeing on the street um, and what do we do and building kind of their hands were tied like what's going on? How do we just, how do we even begin? Where do we begin and how do we begin? And that's what the declaration did. It also brought attention from the federal level. A couple weeks ago, Secretary Castro was the HUD secretary. He was here actually in San Diego. He made a stop in LA because he said, what's going on? What can HUD do? What, you know, what can we do better? Are you not having enough resources? Because their fear was if LA is declaring a state of emergency, other cities will start doing that too. And what does that mean at the federal level? So it gave us an opportunity to really solidify a partnership with the federal and with LA County. When we had the Castro announcement, it was the first time pretty much in recent history that you had three city council members, the LA mayor, and the five board of supervisors in the same room together, and particularly discussing the issue of homelessness. And it wasn't so much just for show, it was really, you know, I think that same week, a couple days later, uh, Supervisor Cool, Cruel and uh, Ridley Thomas came out with their announcement of an additional hundred million. So people are, are looking at what are the resources that we have and how we can get to not just say, here's our pile and we're gonna just deal with our population, but how do we pull the resources together and at the policy level, what are those barriers that make the funding more accessible to providers and organizations on the ground? So we're um, doing a joint planning process. There have been 16 policy summits, everything from land use to outreach and encampment, some of the best practices. We're hoping the community has been involved, and I can send you the link to send out to members, because we need feedback, particularly from those of you who are private um, developers and just from the private sector, particularly around land use issues. And um, how can we incorporate that in the plan? And it's gonna be that plan that will be revealed in January for public comment, <coughs> and then incorporate public comment for final release in February that will guide the 100 million. Both where is it gonna come from? Mayor Garcetti is strong on creating new uh, resources. Looking at, he proposed the linkage fee as part of his development of 100,000 units by 2021, 15,000 of which will be affordable units. He's talked about um, just in-house around recording DEP. So what, how can we generate and how can we capitalize off of the private development to help subsidize some of the affordable housing? Because really when we think, there are many multiple issues of how someone becomes homelessness, or how someone becomes homeless, but how we come out of it really is an affordable housing crisis that we're facing in the city. So how do we balance that need um, with growth and so, particularly some workers in yeah. the city you know, and not have to drive have a two hour commute to work and whatnot. So with that, the most immediate, um, prior to that 100 million, 15 million, we're hoping to release immediately. We've already started funding winter shelter. 10 million will go to um, a style of housing that's just rapid rehousing, which means that it can be a short term rental subsidy for someone, it can cover moving costs. But there are people that we know lost the job or had a major health care crisis, and they just need temporary help to be able to either connect to mainstream benefits or to go back to work, and they'll be fine and moving on into um, unsubsidized housing. Wait, how much money did you have to do that? Uh, 10 million. Okay. And then five went to winter shelters? Uh, 3 million, 15 total, uh, 10 million for rapid rehousing, 3 million for winter shelter, one million, um, we're looking at for on all of this will go. We're hoping that will go to LASA 
Council will still have to decide on that. Our recommendation about a million goes to technology, so we have many outreach workers, including a bit workers, and as they find people right now, people are still doing paper and pencil intake, and we want to be able to link the loss of database with iPads or iPhones in a secure system and streamlined. So looking at feasibility of how to upgrade the current database as well as what technology will work best. And then another million to create regional base, and we're calling them housing source centers. So they would include storage facilities so people can log in their stuff on a voluntary basis, showers, toilets, and also locate case management, the housing placement officers right inside. And so it's not just a drop-in center, but it really is your first um, link into permanent housing. So there, the last million will go to look at how do we create this, and that's really going to be almost spa. It'll probably look different in each spa based on what the local needs are. Uh, this 15 million, has it already been distributed then? Or no, there it's still, it's coming, coming out? it's very, it's still coming out of council committee. We're hoping either this Friday or next Tuesday. Um, that it will come to full council. And then after that, ideally, the council agrees that it goes to LASA, and LASA will contract it out. I would say by January. Is there a criteria for the other types of And within those categories? Sure. So for the rapid rehousing, we want it to be kind of as flexible as possible, because traditionally what's happened is program guidelines almost make the actual accessing funding prohibitive because of all the restrictions. Like you must be single, you must have a substance abuse issue, you must be female, you know. So we want it to be as flexible as possible for LASA. Again, as they kind of feed it out into the coordinated entry systems. Are you guys familiar with the grants? Yeah. Like in spas, these are kind of portals of providers that are working together. Um, we want it to be responsive to those needs. So it will be toward housing people as far as a priority. And within the CES, that funding's targeting people there's an assessment period, so it's tied into how people score on that assessment. Um, as far as the technology and the other centers, right now it's really working with LASA and then who has the outreach with the spas to define what that criteria will look like. But the priority is this is short term funding, this is a chance to help us do more of an evaluation of what's going on so we don't put good money out for that. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's really what it is. It's like we know we have to do something quickly, but we want to do it smart and we want to look at the lessons. Um, the other thing I'm trying to see just quickly. Um, what was 100 million? So the 100 million was an announcement, and that was just a commitment. So that was just kind of throwing a benchmark out there and saying, how are we going to rise to the occasion? And so right now what's happening through this collaborative partnership between the city and the county, we're looking at what are the real needs and what are the opportunities for funding. Some of it may be looking at, for instance, our community development block grant fund that we've already received or some of the continuum of care funding. And it may be starting to prioritize that in a different way based on current needs. Other of the may is really committed to finding new sources. And that's what I think the private sector and our bids and our business in the most, and particularly around development. How do we benefit from the growth but not stymie the growth? How do we provide the right balance of incentives for developers? We're always told our planning process is horrible, it's going to take long, um, it's not quite clear of all the various permitting. Is there a way to streamline that with the benefit of a linkage fee or something to dedicate to the affordable housing trust fund that would also build affordable housing? So those are the real policy challenges. Because everybody thinks, oh, 100 million, that's your biggest problem. There's no 100 million. It's coming. We're, I mean, that's a company's standing by that commitment, so our, everyone is looking for it right now. And, and question, as far as process-wise, one, one of the things that uh, you know, we actually have a transitional housing program um, that uh, the, YMCA, the YMCA does, um, that was defunded because HUD's new guidelines that's focusing on permanent supportive housing. And you were talking about emergency shelters as well as being flexible with rapid rehousing. Um, there's a large population of um, homeless people that are not just the chronically homeless that need to be permanently supportive housed, but have things that are transitional and, and what 
that's the uh, mayor's plan for addressing the whole spectrum of private homes so that we don't have other people falling through the cracks. So we permanently house all these people. Well, I have women that are going to be on the street now because there's nowhere for them to go. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. So that's an important issue. So what she's talking about is loss of, um, through the continuum of care, traditionally we kind of funded three housing projects. One was emergency shelter, which is, particularly in Los Angeles, it's no more than 30 days. It's kind of an emergency situation where some shelters you even have to leave the same day and it's prioritized who can show up that night, others you can stay there 24 hours a day for up to 30 days. The second model is transitional housing, which traditionally has been no more than 24 months or two years. A uh, tenant pays a portion of their rent. It's heavily um, tied to a programmatic component. So a person cannot just be evicted for not paying their rent, but maybe there's like things like curfew or um, behavioral kind of standards that someone must meet to, in order to stay to that house. And then the last option is uh, permanent affordable housing. The most popular that, that we've been talking about is permanent supportive housing, which is housing with a very deep subsidy because there are some <coughs> kind of services attached to it. Others have just gone into regular um, affordable housing where the unit is subsidized, but there's not case management services necessarily attached to it. And what's happened is HUD has said that middle tier for transitional housing in particular is that when you look at the data now that we probably had at least um, a good two decades, the number of people who fall back into homelessness after transitional housing is pretty high compared to the cost. And that you can take that same funding move someone into housing with the appropriate level of services. So if it's wrapping around that unit with case management so that the person stays there, providing a more shallow subsidy for those families that are able to maybe go back to school or improve their income. Maybe it's um, getting linked up with child support, you know, whatever the other income sources are, that they're able to maintain a, a less subsidized affordable housing unit or a Section 8 voucher or something like that. And so loss has been holding off and holding off as one of one of the almost last kind of containment of care. And this year, really because of the scoring criteria at the federal level, made a change in their policy to take that second tier product away. And there were, I think it's uh, about 30, 45, 45 providers that were, who, that were defunded. And this happened within the last month or so. And so now it's how do we hold on to those beds, but help those providers change the program so that we can fund them now that we have a surplus of funding. And that's it's technical, but it's really important because, um, and I'm on the Wausau Commission, so I went through that meeting, a lot of domestic violence shelters are gonna be defunded. And so the question at Wausau was, um, this is the federal government now establishing this policy they want their federal government funds focused on permanent housing. So now the city and the county may to look at how do we more locally fill these resources for transitional and shelter. The problem with shelter right now is we have one uh, 65 bed shelter in Hollywood at CAP, and um, I think all but 10 of those beds now are being used as bridge housing for people moving into permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. So we used to be able to shelter 65 people off the streets, and we can't stay in there, and yet we have more people. So it's um, because it didn't become because it, it, the the beds are being um, because the federal government will not fund shelters anymore. Yeah. So PATH had to to follow the resources. Otherwise, they would have to raise all the money to fund their shelter. But the federal government will fund what was called like bridge housing to, while you're waiting to get into your permanent unit. And so that's what most of those beds have been converted to. But that's it's also an opportunity, though. I mean, one of the things about the hundred million being tied into a planning process is that we really are open for input. We're in a new territory now, um, just with the economy kind of rebounding, but also just the growing overall inequality that we're finding in many communities across the country. Is what are we doing? How do we go protect people that are vulnerable for be and to becoming homeless, as well as how do we lift those that have now become homeless, how do we lift them up? And so it's, um, I would say now more than ever is the time to be creative. If a crisis, house, we call it crisis housing instead of shelter. 
And the difference again is that shelter was more, it was interesting, I, I was talking to a, the pastor, St. Sophia Greek Orthodox, and he said it best. He said, anytime you call someone a guest, you have to really think, are you looking at solving an issue, or is this a temporary thing? And so it's redesigning the design of shelter so that there's a pathway out. It's not just the door in and the door back out the front door, so the door is like spinning, but there's an actual door out to some kind of, and I'm just gonna use permanent housing, oftentimes we think of like a building across the street, I'm looking over there, like we think of a physical development, but permanent housing could be renegotiating, paying someone's back or just living with their parents so that their parents will allow them to come back to live with them. It could be, um, again, a short-term subsidy because someone is waiting for that job offer, or maybe they're out on medical disability, but they'll be back to work in three months. It could be finding the right roommate in a shared housing situation, or it could be applying for Section 8, or if it's more severe, someone with severe mental health. You know, there's different products for it, but the idea is that we've got to get creative. How do we create affordable options for people who live in Los Angeles, including our homeless population? And now it's time again for communities to be very creative and say, you know what? We don't want the kind of shelter that you're going to have where people are lined up around the block at 7 o'clock at night. We don't want that. We want a kind of program where we know that bed is going to turn over at least three times in one year because people are actually moving into housing. And we want it, you know, what size, what are the programs, what are the local community supports that could help people link up to employment, to medical services, to becoming better advocates in the public schools if they have children. You know, so it's all of that that I'm really sincere when the mayor is very open to new ideas of how to do this. And it's a different kind of empowerment, I think, that communities often aren't used to. And um, 1.2, and I still want to listen to well, I haven't exhausted you all this techie policy mm -hmm. stuff, but what's the role for big? I mean, so many of our big officers are frontline on the street. I met with uh, Central City East bid, this bid, there was another bid, um, there was another bid that you know we just been talking to is the spike in violence, the spike in substance abuse, the spike in um, families. So it's people with children that are out in the street in these encampments and often are abandoned. Sometimes if their parents are active substance abusers, the, just the spike in the number of people, the spike in the sense of um, permanency. I would say of encampments or before they have been, you know. None of this is happy, but it's like someone may have been in a sticky bag at the bus stop. But now, someone was telling me, I think it was down in San Pedro, there was like a block long encampment that was pretty sturdy. You wouldn't just be able to go in and take it down, you know, at some point. I mean, there was carpentry still keeping it up. So it's, it's how, do we, how do we adjust this? And what are, what are you guys seeing? And what's, how can we empower bids so that that information that they're seeing and, experience they're having is fed back into us as policymakers, and we can together come up with some different solutions. Mm -hmm. as, far, oh. as far as on the, in the planning process, then um, it, it, this all done through the mayor's office with the separate commission that is focusing on so the county. Yeah, the county has taken the lead with the United Way, the Home for Good program, and there were a series of 16 policy summits. It was eight topics, and they there was like a general overview, gave people a chance to kind of digest the information, and then the chance to come back and say, you know, this is what I think, and let's prioritize some of the strategies or ideas that come out. And I can send the link out. It's on the county page. It's, I think it's 2015 priority. And so their actual policy briefs, the first series will have different questions that are just proposed. And they list all the resources and then questions proposed. And then the second brief should start to be like a draft of actual recommendations. Then those briefs will be tied together into the actual plan of how we're going to address homelessness in Los Angeles. And there will be a point where there is it's open for public comment? Or? Yeah, it's open for public comment now, but there will also be an open for public comment when the whole piece is pulled together. And that's what I'm saying, now is the time to, even if the, like I think, land use and employment I think both sessions have already occurred, but that doesn't mean public comment has closed. We still would be very open to receiving feedback. So I'm on the one, this is what I was referring to today, Michael, in that email. I'm on the one on um, uh, engaging.
engagement and outreach because what's happening throughout LA County is siloed outreach, you know, to someone who's out there. So the veterans guy will show up and the local church will show up and the cop will show up and there's not enough coordination so that you are encircling that person in an intentional way, having a similar message, making sure they are involved in the coordinated of entry systems so you know what the needs are. Um, and so how do you, there's so there's much scarce outreach resources out there, but if everything were knitted together, it, it, it might be more effective. So that's one that I've been assigned to. Um, I missed the first meeting, I don't know the second meeting this week. And um, yeah, it's people from all over the county, so that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. In different cities that we can learn from Pasadena or Long Beach or some, even West Covina is participating. So they're much smaller, but sometimes in that rifle field, we learn something like, oh wait, we should try that. We never thought of that. So one of the things I mentioned to Elisa, I, I sent her my blogs um, that we noticed an uptick in new people in Hollywood. And, um, you know, we, we surveyed them. A lot of people seem to be attracted to Southern California from other states. Don't know if that's an aberration and that just happens in Hollywood and Venice or if it's a, if it's a broader trend. Um, but it seems a little unfair to start uh, providing housing resources for people who have not been living in California when we have so many people in need who are already here. So I raise that as an, 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 a research need. There needs to be more research on that. And also on what appears to be an uptick in drug use. Um, and Prop 47, which has been in effect now for about a year, we see a lot of people addicted to crystal meth and heroin, and there is no incentive to go into drug rehabilitation anymore. There's a no, uh, the, the drug diversion programs coming out of the courts are not in place like they used to be. And so, is there a portion of Prop 47 that needs to be fixed? And what, you know, like, is there a conversation about that with our state elected officials and law enforcement? And it's sad, uh, I'm watching one person I know in particular who had achieved a year of sobriety and got back into crystal meth and was vastly spiraling downward after having spent six months in the county jail and someone who we all know here in Hollywood. No, no resources that we could even turn into the, when and if you were ready to, you know, go into recovery. So it's a deep need. Change that. Probably. Yeah, there's, you know, I use the uh, park that's across the street that's supposed to be just for kids only and old user to Yeah, and, and you know, well, the rest is because there's no point because it's just a uh, ball. Times of the day. Yeah. One of the things I was thinking about, so it's a good thing that we now have a committee on homelessness and poverty. It started off as an ad hoc committee back in the spring, but now it's an actual committee. So there are topics like this that we can maybe do a public hearing on. That would be great. You know, um, yeah. to really hear the testimony and get the data, that will help us collect the data. Mm -hmm. You know, we would just need to figure out how to get people. Particularly anything that's drug related, you know, like how do you get people to show up and how do you get people to testify so we can start hearing a little bit more what's going on and not speculating. But I can say the crystal meth and heroin in particular, I've heard similar things on in Venice, Skid Row, and South LA. So it just makes me wonder is there a larger epidemic going on that we're seeing kind of merging and blending in what happens? And then, you know, people um, need to uh, have money to buy the drugs, and if they don't have a source of income, that is why we've got, you know, property theft, crime, assault. Yes. See, that would be good to come out in the hearing, like, how, what are, you know, what are, not bad things, but crime has gone up, petty crime has gone up, mm -hmm. uh, car breakers have gone up. Those things. Well, I think petty crime is anything. Still a misdemeanor at this level, less than nine hundred dollars. Nine hundred something dollars. Yeah. You, you can steal a gun, and then it's a misdemeanor. But it, but it doesn't negate the importance of documenting. So, for instance, we've been talking a lot of our planning around homelessness policy came from some of the best practices from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, from a lot of the work of Home for Good, um, from our VA, and from the HUD department. But that's looking at homelessness for people really vulnerable to housing who have ongoing mental health or physical health needs that, you know, when the hospital
hospitals were broken down in the 80s, these are people who pretty much had to try to figure out how to survive on the street. And so it was developing a solution and a product around that. And what we're finding are younger people, higher substance abuse issues, housing may not be the right solution. This may be bringing in the county to say, okay, where are we at with substance abuse prevention dollars? You know, the Affordable Care Act, substance abuse is now a reimbursable um, activity. How can we reuse some of the Affordable Care Act to increase the funding available for substance abuse treatment? Now, granted, you can't force people to it, but at least if there were maybe more options, there's a way. So that, that's why it's so critical, even if we can't necessarily persecute someone right away, there could be other preventive and intervention programs that we just aren't really have, we either don't have, or definitely not at the scale that we need to build the case. Well, also, deep inside LA. Besides the great weather, can they figure out why, how do you make LA less attractive to people, young people, who mm -hmm. just come here and hang out and, and then get themselves in a lot of trouble? Yes, sir. As opposed yeah. well to being in the home foot stage where they come to close to family or close to friends and they're not here, they're just coming home. And the real spirals from there. Um, what, 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 what other factors come into play that people come in here will, and what are other cities or states doing to combat those issues? That's one thing. Um, the University has been in touch with like, the mayor of Seattle, Portland, just all the west, up and down the west coast. And luckily, we have HUD backing on this is that as certain communities tend to increase criminalization of homelessness, homelessness, you see the migration outwards. So we all take a stance of balancing out the criminalization of homelessness and not criminalizing, then we hopefully we won't see that kind of push-pull factor. The other part is, you know, I grew up in LA forever, even though I was gone and came back, and it's like homelessness has always been part of the landscape. And we have to change, I think, our own mindsets around that and start sending messages more about the community. And I think that happens with the banner and the marking community, you know, there's physical designs and the public art and having open community meetings where you start to spread out, hey, to be in this community, there's a level of responsibility, there's a level of commitment, there's a level of um, a reciprocity of what does it take to be a member of this community? And I think those are the messages, these are kind of the less law enforcement, the more community spirit or kind of intervention because then people will get the message that Wait, if I have to go to California, they're putting pressure on me that I have to volunteer or I have to go to a community meeting or I'm expected to take my tent down and go find a job. You know, that message starts to get out where if we stay in these silos and ignore the issue, it's kind of like, oh, no one's paying attention so I can do what I want to do. So it kind of takes a more, um, like that, what is it, the street light approach, you know, really bringing people out to the streets, doing festivals and things like that in a very intentional way to build community, not to exclude, but to really share that this is a community commitment to live in LA. That's what makes LA great. So this uh, right to rest uh, project is not gonna help us. The right to rest back to us at that. Uh, State Senator Carol Wu, which would allow um, you to essentially live on the sidewalk in the public right of way with no limit on number of hours in the day or number of days in the week. You know so, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. SB 608, and okay. it, it was it was turned into a two year bill. It obviously, um, you know, it was a pretty quick coalition of bids and leaving California cities and law enforcement that rose up against that. We actually met with Carol Wu. So Carol, and also it basically said that business improvement districts could not engage with people who are homeless because it was considered harassment. And which we sat down with her and said, our, our EIDs know every person who's homeless and have been instrumental in helping so many people and saving people's lives. So, you know, we are not the, the bad guy here. If anything, we're, we're first responders in many respects. So we had a pretty constructive conversation with her, but she made it a two-year bill. Not, she, didn't, she didn't pack it up and put it in the way of box. Yeah. yeah, because I think, so kind of at a local level, we kind of went the 
from office of direction with 56 and 11, which is a bill that's still being um, negotiated and mediated within city council, and that was the one that wants to automatically remove tents and other things that are obstructing the sidewalk. And so there's always this tension. There's a balance between what are the rights of someone who really has no other place to go? You can't penalize them just for being homeless, but what are the rights of people who have to walk up and down the street? Someone in a wheelchair with a baby carriage, or just someone who wants to walk into a school or into their apartment. So how do you balance these rights? So I know one of the most recent amendments was about having uh, tents and other, I guess, permanent there really shouldn't be permanent, but kind of attachments come down between the hours of six in the morning to nine o'clock at night. And that so, passed. no, this is they're still this negotiating is the it. Municipal code um, section yeah. that yeah. Um, they're been working on. Mm -hmm. Going municipal code, it only apply to LA um, because so. of the ACLU settlement. Yeah. 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 But that might be something that we have to look in on. Well, I mean, we've got full on encampments all along, you know, Vine Street and Homewood. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and uh, what's the street that I'm doing? The um, Which has, it, you know, I enjoy hearing people say, yes, people should have the right to live on the streets. Then our maintenance crew are dealing with human defecation, urine, and trash every day. Our guys are just exhausted. And so it, there's a reason why we don't condone living on the streets because there is no infrastructure for that process. So, you know, you get into a push pull on this, the, the, this as you say, the balance uh, of the rights, but the actual implications are our, our crews are out there cleaning this stuff up now every day. And the fused needles and, and other things that are you know, even, even around the facility and the city lot and that sort of stuff that we have to go through and check. You know, we have kids that are walking through and pray to have the whole process. Yeah, one of our guys got the bricks with empty and trash in because there were so many in there. I'm sorry, anyway. I'm, I'm Brian Fold. Um, and uh, did, did you talk about, for lack of a better description, this gypsy culture issue? Yes. Okay. A little bit, okay. yeah. I'll, 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 I, won't, I won't come back on that. But that, that is something that I think is really important to, to look at from the standpoint of, you know, it, the definition of the homelessness issue. There's, there's this element that is uh, choosing to live a certain kind of lifestyle on the street that is coming to L.A. Um, and the word is out because of the uh, nature of how we're handling the homeless issue that it's, that it's easy to live on the street here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they're taking advantage of that. There's a certain percentage of individuals that are out there that are taking advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And is that kind of the younger population? Yeah. Of yeah. All yeah. 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 South Penn yeah. And there's been a lot of discussion about and you and I talk about this, that the label homeless is too broad a tent, that there is there needs to be a different nomenclature here because the individuals who are truly homeless, chronically homeless, deserving of permanent housing, we need to help them. That is, like you say, it's different layers. So homelessness is too big broad a brush to paint. And if we come out of this with a better language for it, it helps to better define the problem. Well, I do agree with what you said earlier that some no matter what Terry says, the sense of planning is important because I think there is like a classification for what you need to go to the basis. It's like pizza pie mm -hmm. and take it apart and then there's different solutions. There's no holistic solution. There's no cost of solution because you go to pizza pie. Certainly it's better, you know, with the, the network of the meeting. The first thing I would do is like, there's a veterans administration, you've got a federal federal government obligation to deal with veterans. Mm -hmm. So that the first thing I would do is even if they're really sick, I don't know what percentage they are to them, but deal with that segment of the population first where there's there's actually entities in place who can deal with the problem now. And they're making yeah, they're total progress. And they're making yeah. progress. Yeah. 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 So just and then go from, you know, work your way through the different categories. But they need right, there needs to be some more sex before you sort of spend a lot of money. Exactly. It needs to be spent, but before you spend it, we need to make sure we're going to rise with it. Exactly. And that may be something too, because um, 
we're going to talk about data and how do we collect data. So how do we change what we see to actual numbers or points that we can measure? And maybe that's a conversation with some of the groups on the west side and the Venice community too to kind of identify some more characteristics of the gypsy culture mm -hmm. because then maybe that's the kind of youth outreach that we need to do. Maybe that's Covenant House or some of the other kind of youth focus providers. And we're meeting with Covenant House, I think it's sometime next week, so I'll just spell it out to see what they're seeing. Covenant House is a national. I just wrote them in the chat. Oh, good. Okay, so maybe they'll be happy. <laughs> But maybe we can find out some of their data and, you know, figure out how to incorporate with CES or with the bids or just figure out how to be more honest. It's definitely harder to engage the, the young transition age youth. They're, you know, they're not interested in coming into an apartment at this point and, um, you know, and getting the services. No. Yeah. We've been finding it with the events of all the populations and stuff. It's the same, Tay age is kind of between the ages of 16 and 21. So some of our younger vets coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq were in that, like 21, 22, 23. They're the hardest to reach because they're not out on the streets. They're south, they're couch surfing with family or friends or former military buddies. And the, the label homelessness, they just, it's not quick, but they don't see themselves as homeless. So although there are all these resources that could help them have a home of their own and make it more stable, they're just, the language again is so key that we're not able yeah. to connect with that. Yeah, the language is key, because I think there's a pride factor in, involved in that as well. So we really need to look at that label, and uh, you know, if there are people who are ready and willing to get the help, but they just don't want to accept or acknowledge mm -hmm. the, the defining label, that's, that's an issue as well.